Everything has a life price. It's always the equal amount of life you're willing to invest in it to achieve. Hello, everyone. It's episode 78 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Sir Gemini Asante. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I founded Whistlekick, and I'm also your host here for Martial Arts Radio. Whistlekick, as so many of you know already, makes the world's best sparring gear, as well as really great apparel and accessories, all for practitioners and fans of traditional martial arts. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank those of you checking us out again. If you're not familiar with our products, head on over to whistlekick.com and take a look at what we make. If there's one thing we've become known for, other than this podcast, it's our sparring boots. They're the closest thing you can get to sparring barefoot, but they're still safe and comfortable. Add to that the lack of a toe strap, more durable materials, and longer lasting design, and you start to see why they've become so popular so quickly. Check them out over at whistlekick.com. Now, if you want to see the show notes for this or any other episode, those are on a whole different website, and that's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're over there, go ahead and sign up for the newsletter. We offer special content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. We only email a few times a month, we never sell your information, and sometimes we even throw in a coupon. Now, today on Martial Arts Radio, we have a really interesting guest, someone unlike anyone we've had on before. Sir Gemini Asante gives us a wonderful look inside the world of historical European martial arts, but he has a lot of time in with martial arts styles that more of us are used to. This makes him uniquely qualified to give us an introduction to what his world looks like and help us understand the similarities between his practices and the rest of the martial arts community. Let's go. Sir Gemini, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. What a fun to have you here. Now, of course, I welcomed you with a title that few in the Asian martial arts are going to be familiar with. Yeah. So we should probably explain right off the bat that you are not here as a representative or, or um, primarily a karate stylist or a taekwondo stylist. So let's just kind of wrap the answer of that into the first question. How did you get started in the martial arts, and why am I referring to you as sir? I started in the martial arts when I was seven. I began, I was a very active, energetic child, and but we lived out in the country here in California, a very small town called Gustine, only about 3,000, 4,000 people in it at the time, and we lived out in the country on a ranch, and other than ranch work to do, you know, you would watch Kung Fu theater on Sunday and then go out and pretend to be a, a ninja or Kung Fu master and run around. But because, you know, there's not a whole lot of people out here, you'd, you'd be doing it by yourself. <laughs> and uh, I was very active and, and I wanted to um, learn martial arts. I wanted to learn karate or Kung Fu. Actually, I wanted to learn Kung Fu and I bugged my mother and bugged her and bugged her. And I think she thought it might be a good way to get some of my extra energy out. So uh, I started taking classes in a town about 40 miles away, 30 miles away. And I went in to observe a class. And it was very intense. It was in this old, um, it used to be a post office downtown in a town called Ceres and I remember walking in and they my parents just dropped me off they they had other things to go do and so they dropped me off and I was going to watch the adult class and then go take the kids class it was a brand new thing for for him <clears throat> so I remember watching it and everybody was stretching and sweating and, and just very intense and I remember this very slight short guy walks in and everybody, whatever they were doing, just instantly snapped to attention, stood up, bowed, and he walked through the room and then walked into his office. And then, you know, everybody went back to their very intense stretching, preparing for the lesson. And I was just in awe. I thought, my goodness, what is this guy? He was just, just like the masters I was seeing on television. And uh, 
that very same class, uh, one of the guys that I was watching achieved the splits for the first time. Um, and then about three seconds later, the screaming started because he had ripped all of the, all of the, uh, uh, ligaments in the inside of his groin on each side <laughs> and they called the ambulance uh-huh. and took him away and all of this time while I'm standing there watching to this day I am not extremely flexible and I think part of that is psychological <laughs> but <laughs> I stayed anyway and uh, I watched the class and I was just absolutely amazed um, his kids class was only once a week though and so I did that and immediately, like two weeks later, we went outside and started working out in a park. I learned later that he had just leased the or rented the building for a couple of months. And as soon as summer started, he, he always practiced in, in outside. He never stayed inside. And his name was Dave Spinella. Um, and he was the most impressive man I'd ever seen in my entire life. And I would go back every week. And I did that for about two and a half years. And when I turned 10, um, I was got the opportunity to go uh, full-time, which was two to three times a week. And I, there was two-hour sessions. It was Taekwondo. And he was extremely strict. And I was unbelievably fanatical. And I went two to three times a week, two to three hours at night. Um, and we practiced outside, outside, outside the first summer. And then we took a jog like we normally do. And we jogged and stopped. We went out of the park, down the street, and we stopped in front of this building that had, you know, Modesto Society of Self-Defense. And I was just in awe. It was like my my uh, Mecca, my Shangri-La. And we walked in and it had, every, you know, everything and nothing all at the same time. It had mirrors and wood floors and a couple of, you know, posters on the wall. And that was it. Nothing else, man. There was a little place in the back to change. And um, that is where I took my beatings. Um, I couldn't go to the kids' class. And he didn't do a really extensive kids' class. And so he said that because I had been going for a couple of years and I was very dedicated, he offered that I could sit in and go to the adult class. And I was just thrilled. And so I did. And the youngest person next to me was 19 years old, and they did not treat me like a 10-year-old. I fought and sparred and kicked and punched and worked out on that hardwood floor um, and, you know, beat myself into what I thought a, a great martial artist would be. And I, I practiced every day. Um, I still practice every day, oddly enough. And um, I went through until I was 16 with him, almost 17 with Dave. And then he closed the school. And uh, I took about a year off, still practiced every day, and then found the Goju Ru school. And I studied Goju Ru for the next five years through Black Belt. And then uh, the same school offered an Akijitsu classes. And I remained there. And uh, there and at another location they moved to and did Akijitsu for another four. Um, I was also um, exposed to Western boxing and a uh, French style called savat, which is French kickboxing, and um, studied French kickboxing savat for another three years along with it. And finally, in Asian styles, I studied um, a kempo, an American kempo. Um, they called it shoshu kempo out here, but it was basically a an American Kimpo, um, and I went through Black Belt in American Kimpo as well. Then I started in 1994, 95. I took my first seminar in Western style martial arts. <clears throat> that is the martial arts from Europe, starting from the medieval period around 1300, and it travels all the way down to the present day. Um, it's not as known as or as recognizable as the Asian styles. But once I began with it, I began with um, learning about a treatise um, by an Italian author. Uh, He was born in about 1350, um, and he wrote a book um, called The Flower of Battle. 
and the Getty Museum down in California here has a copy. There's four copies in existence, um, and it has text, and it just absolutely came alive. I started studying um, and learning more and more about it, taking seminars with people like Bob Karen, who was one of the leading authorities on it at the time, and just absolutely fell in love with the idea of the medieval knights and the Western weapons. I was always super, super interested in weapons and nunchucks, the sword, samurai sword, um, uh, the, the bow, uh, the joe, um, and, and spear. Um, I was always fascinated with weapons and I excelled at them. And so taking on Western weapons really called to me. Um, so I kept studying and along the way I would find anybody and everybody that I could practice with, which was pretty sparse and rare at the time. It has gained a huge amount of popularity since then. And there are organizations, there are reenactment groups, there are, um, and reenactment groups range from attempting to just reenact, um, combat that have, and they've turned into kind of a, a sport groups. Um, like the Society of Creative Anachronism, they're, they're more of a sport group. They're, consider them like um, a kendo, what kendo would be to um, the actual steel representation of the samurai sword, right? Kendo can strike uh, specific targets. They wear specific armor. Um, you know, there are specific rules and engagement sort of thing. Those type of groups do that type of combat. Um, then there's a historical European martial arts or HEMA groups and they use different types of materials. The, the reenactment groups mainly stick to rattan wood, um, much like an Eskrima stick in a Filipino style, uh, only much thicker. They run about an inch and a quarter, inch and a half uh, to make weapons out of. The uh, HEMA groups um, tend to use either blunted steel, which are called rebated steel, or they use um, uh, poly mold. Uh, synthetic weapons that represent the same heft and width of a real blade. And there's been a lot of advances in technology in using those types of training tools. Most of the time you use anything from general modern fencing gear, although, again, the community has grown so much that there are entire industries now on, on the gear alone. And uh, all the way up to full armor. I fight all the way up into in tournaments, all the way up to full harness. I wear a harness that represents about 1380, 1400s. Um, and uh, we can talk about that, what it is and all that. Um, but, and then I wear just fencing gear sometimes. It just depends on the type of tournament. But I wanted to do it all, just like I did in the Asian styles. And uh, so I've been doing and competing in that for the last 17 years. And in their rankings, in some of the styles, uh, they do have rankings, just like the Asian styles do. Um, they vary from school to school, from place to place. And in one of the first ones that I received uh, was in a group where you, uh, it was more of the, the sport side of it. Um, and that was called the SCA, Society of Creative Anachronism. And you go up through the ranks kind of kind of in the same vein as a martial art, except you don't um, graduate in belt rankings. You go up and you fight in tournaments and you fight in melees, which are groups on groups, full contact. Um, and you have to achieve a certain amount of, uh, of knowledge about the history and, the, and, and, and so forth. And you're actually voted on by a council. Uh, it, they also take into account your... Um, what they call your peer-like qualities. So are you a good person? Are you a leader? Um, are you honest? Do you uphold those ideals of chivalry? And that's one of the things that has followed me along this career um, all the way through. And the council votes, and the title that you receive is knight. And that's why the title of sir comes with it. And you know, a lot of the HEMA groups, uh, historical European martial arts groups, they have different title sets. They go all the way up to masters um, in theirs. But really, I keep the title loosely as Sir Gemini. Um, my real name is Gemini, hazards of being born in the 60s. <laughs> um, but I do keep the title simply because my school 
uh, not only has the martial art aspect to it and a very serious one, but the entire idea of the school, the entire emphasis of the school and the training also upholds the ideals of chivalry. And what I've always found interesting in that is those ideals, if you go through the ideals of, of Taekwondo, right, you have honesty, integrity, indomitable spirit, right, the whole the list um, that, that people, you know, uh, count off every time. Well, the knightly virtues are exactly the same as that because, you know, humans want to treat humans as they want to be treated, right? So um, those, uh, those, those things are always present. That's how humans want to set up a system to treat each other. So, you know, the ideals of chivalry for us are honor and courtesy, justice, prowess, which is, you know, your feats of arms, strength, humility, courage, honesty, and fidelity. And so uh, it, that type of environment really, really spoke to me. And a lot of the, the Western community just focuses on um, interpretation of the old manuscripts and, and bringing them to life in the martial arts. I wanted to always hold on to the attachment of those social interactions that a martial artist would have and the social responsibilities that a martial artist would have. And so we um, really purport the ideals of chivalry, which is why our school is called Knight's Quest. And that's been my journey in a nutshell. Wow, cool. So obviously it was a lot of fun for me when we started talking, the, the idea of having you on the show, because you do represent this different aspect of martial arts, one that we haven't had on the show and one that I'm going to guess the majority of our listeners aren't familiar with. I know I'm certainly very unfamiliar with medieval martial arts. I mean, European martial arts, I think, is, is how you were referring to it, historical European martial arts. Mm -hmm. So you have this wonderful ability to bring in this new information to us, but you also have the context of Asian martial arts, which the majority of our listeners are going to be looking at what you're saying from that perspective. So you're, you're a nice bridge for us. And as you said, it is becoming more popular. Here I am in Vermont and we have a group, multiple groups now mm -hmm. that are offering historical European martial arts. It's not huge. You can't find it the same way you could find Taekwondo or a karate school, but they're out there and they're growing. Yes. Yes. And I think that <clears throat> one of the things that I saw um, beginning in my my studies of European martial arts and, and um, deeper European uh, medieval history and such was that the ability to teach it, especially to children, was not as prevalent. You had some people that came from the Asian styles um, that were working with it, but you had a lot of people that came from a classical fencing background, um, but you didn't have a whole lot of people that could structure it and see it as a structure to um, reinterpret for others. Um, some schools uh, adhere strictly just to the manus just to a specific manuscript. So there are some schools that are strictly Fiore de Liberi schools. They strictly work off of his manuscripts, and they are beautiful. Um, you can find them easily online. Um, you can find the illustrations and the translations. Um, that we have up to date. Um, and the translations are complete, but they, uh, just like all other translations, um, they change because people do more and more work on it and they realize that, you know, in previous translations, you missed the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. And uh, uh, the word doesn't mean what you thought it meant. And so you kind of go, oh, okay, that's what that means. And, and that's a constant. Some people are of the the German school, some people are of the Italian school. Fiori is more of the Italian school. You have the German school, which is more of the uh, Lichtenhauer line. Um, Hans Tallhofer wrote around the same time, actually, interestingly enough. Um, he wrote, he was born in the 1400s and uh, uh, wrote thereafter. And he had an illustrated manuscript, beautiful illustrations. Um, and so you have these illustrations done around the, around the same time. We don't have anything earlier than the 1300s. The earliest one that we have intact is uh, what people refer to as the 133. 
and that is a manuscript on Sword and Buckler. Um, it's an anonymous author, and the reason it has that name is because that's what it was categorized in the Royal Armories, um, because it was an anonymous author. Uh, some people call it the I-33, and it is uh, also full of beautiful illustrations and some uh, some explanations, and there are entire schools devoted to that one system as well. Um, my school is not. My school is a hybrid. Um, my school is probably one of the first hybrids that actually took the manuscripts and took the techniques over the last 15 years and empl employed them into a, what a practical application could be. So not only do we use the weapons of the period, but we also use practical application because of my Asian style background. Um, for instance, there are many kicks and punches shown in the manuscripts. There are no explanations on how to do them, though. Um, not that we've seen so far. But from my Asian-style background, and especially from my background in Savat, um, I, I use Savat techniques in the punches and kicks, kicks that we use in our style. Our style is called Aplamakia. And I know that's kind of a daunting word, but it literally translates to fighting in armor. And so I use that bridge to kind of um, not only look at it from a 21st century mind, because obviously I was not there, but I also look at it as something that I can teach to everyone and try to make it as accessible to as many people as possible. Cool. Well, that's quite the primer, and I'm sure that a lot of us listening, or sorry, maybe I shouldn't speak for everyone. I can speak for myself, though. You know, I, I feel like I have a much better understanding of what it is you do, and not only the differences, but you know, I'm really feeling like there's a lot more similarity than I would have expected when we started. Huge, huge. So and I, I think and you would great. recognize, yeah, you would recognize every kick, every punch, um, every grappling technique. Uh, we work from a manuscript on wrestling. Um, we work from a, a 1500s manuscript on, on wrestling from um, uh, Fabian von Oswald, who was a grappler in Germany. And the, the techniques that you see in his, in his uh, manuscript and uh, many others, we have hundreds of manuscripts, but none is really as complete. Um, you'll see the same judoka moves, you see the same, the exact same. You know, I, I am still a student. I feel that's very, very important. And I am a, an akidoka. I take uh, Aikido. And I study from a, a wonderful instructor, uh, Anna Davis Sensei, here. And the, the similarities in the techniques are fascinating and thrilling because, you know, a, a lock is a lock is a lock. The human body works only so many ways. We only have 206 bonds and they only work in certain ways. And so there's really nothing new under the sun Again, it's it's just a, a everybody's different take on 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 how it works. Yeah, and certainly I don't want to go down this rabbit hole because I'm sure you and I could talk for quite a long time on it. But you know, in the martial arts, uh, especially in a lot of Asian martial arts, people get bogged down in history and lineage and who was the first yes. to do certain things and yes. how old is this art? Yes. And I bet we could have a discussion about some of these roots because you know if you have access if we have access to these manuscripts now certainly people had access to them a hundred years ago so you yes. know, where is that influence flowing where do those lines really go um and we have a you know, people people think a lot of times that there there was a disconnect there really wasn't um we have many authors from you know through the 16 and the 17 and the 1800s and the 1900s that wrote about these um these masters they wrote about these authors. So it was never really lost. It just really wasn't as paid attention to. You know, um, I, I'll give you an example of something completely different, but has the same type of application. So you, have you seen the um, Sherlock Holmes movies? The new, the newer set? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, Arthur Conan Doyle wrote the Sherlock Holmes movies, right? Not the movies, yep. I'm sorry, the books. The, the books. Well, inside the Sherlock Holmes um, uh, series, he described uh, the, the martial art that Sherlock Holmes used. It was called Barditsu, okay? And 
for a long time, it was really kind of just ignored and thought as part of something in his books, in the fantasy. Well, there were a few people that knew knew of it, but there was a lot of people that all of a sudden went, well, wait a minute, let's go take a look at this. And sure enough, um, in the 1800s, um, Japanese were coming to England, and a few of them, Judoka especially, were uh, being introduced in England and using a part of their art along with um, uh, English boxing and a lot of other English traditional uh, techniques, stick fighting, sword fighting, and it was a, a martial art that eventually developed in Victorian England and Edwardian England called Bartitsu. And to this day, we have people that are rediscovering, unearthing this art. And it's fascinating and it's beautiful. There's these judo throws that are strictly judo throws because they were judoka coming from Japan and living in England in these places. These places were very forward thinking for their time. Women took martial arts at that time. They learned to defend themselves for self-defense purposes walking out in the streets of London. And there are techniques involving an umbrella or a walking cane or a walking stick. And so, you know, it's amazing how these martial arts from all over the world will blend because humans have been blending for, you know, millennia. And, and it's, it's, it's incredibly fascinating to me to see those um, convergences. Yeah. And if, if you or if anyone out there is, used to following Whistlekick on social media, you know that we've put out some of those pieces mm. about people rediscovering, you know, the lost actual martial art of Sherlock Holmes and, sure. and the early women's self-defense stuff. Because, you know, as we start to dig in and really discover, you know, I, I'm a bit of a history nerd and also a martial arts nerd, you know, t two of my passions. And so anytime they intersect, that's a lot of fun. Yeah, a f good, good friend of mine, Tom Badillo, out in San Francisco, actually, is one of the, the, the best practitioners on the West Coast that I know of. And uh, he and quite a few others will put on, uh, we have what's called Dickens Fair out here in San Francisco at the Cow Palace is one of our big um, stadiums, uh, where they reenact the world of Charles Dickens uh, during the winter time. And he puts on Bartitsu um, tournaments and demonstrations, and they're beautiful to watch. You can actually go on YouTube and just look up Dickens Fair, and you'll probably see him um, doing, doing some of them. It's pretty impressive. Oh, cool. So that was quite the intro, quite the, <laughs> the setup. I mean, obviously we got, we got a little bit deeper cause we had to, you know, we needed a little sure. bit more context before we could go on, before we could talk about who you are and, and your journey through the martial arts over the last 17 years, I think you said, but yeah, now it's story time. Yeah, the Western martial arts through 17. Yeah, Eastern from seven. Yeah, Right, right. So, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a lot there. Yeah. Of course, it, it sounds like, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's the Western martial arts that you're most passionate about now. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. So, I mean, martial arts is a journey, and, and for just about all of us, we wander, maybe not always to different styles or to different continents of styles, but... You know, we, we move around a, a little bit, and I think it's important for us to understand who you are now to have that context. Mm -hmm. So let's let's dig through, and this can be from any point in your timeline, of course, but why don't you tell us a story? Tell us your best martial arts story. So I did some thinking about this, and uh, as I told you uh, kind of in our pre-show talk, I, I've actually listened to every episode of this podcast. I am a huge fan of this podcast. I, I think it has fantastic content, and I love the format of it, and I love the story aspect of it. I didn't and hear him to say that. No, no, no. No money is exchanged <laughs> hands at all. I, I really do, and uh, I actually was turned on to it because I, I listened to Martial Arts Podcast, and another Martial Arts Podcast, Martial Talk, um, actually mentioned you. Very uh, uh, with uh, a lot of praise and they weren't wrong. So um, the story I have is, as my best is because I think it was the one that was most ingrained in me from the very beginning. Um, there's been a long journey and a lot of tournaments and a lot of, of, of practicing and a lot of injuries and, and you know, fighters, uh, martial artists are not always smart people. We'll fight when we're hurt. 
we'll fight when we're injured, we'll fight when we're sick, we'll fight when we're not supposed to. And a lot of us do that. Um, when I think back to one of the most influential or the best moments I had, I had finished, I was 10, and I started with um, subbing him. And um, as I said, we, I was fanatical. I worked out every day. I trained every single day. My poor parents. I broke everything that was wood or brick on the ranch. I broke every bag they bought me. It just, you know, it, I punched in the sand because, you know, and in uh, Into the Dragon, you know, there's that part where they're shoving their hands in the hot sand and shoving their hands in the hot rocks and stuff. And I thought, well, that must be yeah. something you do to train. So I'm in the backyard <laughs> pounding in sand, literally, and pounding in buckets of rocks and just crazy stuff. But I, he was, a, I don't know, I don't know how much of a traditionalist he was from his instructor. I never really learned a lot about his instructor his master. But I'll tell you this. He was one of the most impressive people I have ever seen. And I wanted to be that just like that student on the, in the movies. You know, I wanted to be that that uh, that pupil, that disciple. And I worked really really hard at it. I poured everything I had into it. And I was a, a white belt for over 2 years. In that system there was no stripes and only five belts. And I never got a black belt in Taekwondo and I'm all absolutely, I'm really actually proud of that because at that time you were not even allowed to test under the age of 18 in his system, in his, in his house, in his school. And so I fought with the adults. I, you know, sparred with the adults and he invited you to test. And, um, he was, I remember watching him one time, um, write out in hand, in, by hand, um, calligraphied invitations to his test for his students. Um, and it was this huge thing, you know, if you got an invitation to test, cause he only tested, I think twice or three times a year. And that uh, was this huge thing. And it was very private deal, um, held in the school and such. And I was a white belt for over two years and I didn't think anything of it. I thought that's how it was supposed to go, you know? Um, I thought that's what everybody did, right? It's what they did on the movies. You worked your entire life as an apprentice, that whole, what they call it, Kaizen uh, in, in Japanese, where you, you work at a specific task your entire life uh, to achieve a perfection that will never come. Um, and I remember about two and a half years. So you have to remember, I started with him when I was seven. So I'm 12 now, almost 13. And after all this time, he, as I'm leaving class one day, sweaty and, and, and bedraggled, he hands me an envelope and smiles. And I, I literally thought I was Charlie getting the golden ticket to the Wampa factory. I was absolutely, I, I was stunned. I, I, for some reason, I just, it just never dawned on me that I would, that I would get the test you know, before I was an adult or something, I don't know what I was thinking at the time. And I remember getting it. And I remember going through the test about a, a month later and it was grueling. It was four hours for an orange belt. Um, it was incredible. It was incredible. And uh, I did it. I took the test and he did not give your rankings at the end of the test. He said, thank you very much. He had two other masters come down and evaluate with him and the senior student, uh, which was Mr. McKissick, um, evaluated. And so I tested and then went back to class and about a month went by, a month and a half went by. And after a, a one class, one evening, a really hard one, uh, remember we really went through the ringer of kata and you know, punches and, and slam, you know, we did the whole thing. You ever, I don't know if you guys did that where you would slam your foot on the floor to warm up your feet and get the ball of your feet tough, you know, and you'd hear this bang, oh. bang, bang. Remember that? No, um, I've never done that, but that doesn't oh, yeah, sound we pleasant. Used to do that all the time. <laughs> so, and you do the same thing. You'd, you'd kneel down and you'd pound on the wood floor to get your hands. Anyway, um, we got done with this class and I'm, I'm kind of straggling out and he, uh, no, we hadn't stopped class. We were just about ready to bow out. And he asked me to come forward and kneel. And I, I came forward and I kneeled down 
and he asked me for my belt. And so I took it off and, uh, out of his, um, gi, he had went back, uh, while we were setting up to bow out, he went into his office for a minute. And I guess he went and got, got it. And out of his gi, he pulled out my orange belt. And I was in tears. To this day, I get emotional about it. Because it was years and years and years of work. And it, it didn't matter as much as the smile that he had. The, um, the glow about him. About somebody dedicated enough to... To, to stay with him. And um, that was absolutely the proudest thing I ever had. And to this day, I don't have my white belt um, because he kept it. And uh, it, it was unbelievably moving to me and I'll never forget it. And I've, you know, I've, like I said, I was proud of that. I went all the way through the red to red belt with him, but, and he, he unfortunately had to close the school. And I went through black belts in, in Gojiru. I went to black belts in Shishu uh, Kempo, um, uh, and, uh, you know, studied pretty deep in Akijitsu and, uh, you know, getting a knighthood, um, winning the major tournaments in a lot of organizations and reenactment groups and HEMA tournaments. Um, you know, I try not only to, um, practice, but excel. In, in everything I delved into, especially in the martial arts. But that was something um, I think, I, I don't think I've ever come across anything so special in my martial career was my first ranking from him. And why would you say that was so special? Was it the time you had to invest? Was it that it was your your first rank? I think it, what, what I think it? it was all all together, right? You're, you're, you start at seven and this mythical little man <laughs> just, you know, he was just, guy just out of a movie, man. And everything he did was this, you know, and, and I'm sure I'm looking at it through 10 year old eyes, but everything he did was perfect. You know, we had students that were twice his size and he could, and it wasn't a mystical thing at all. I mean, he could punch a hole through your chest. And everything on him was iron, man. And um, I, I and I worked so hard, and I didn't st- stop working hard. Um, you know, I was still as fanatical. I still practiced, you know, every single day. Uh, you know, and it must have instilled something because I still practice something every single day. But I think that whole being a child, the wonderment of the martial arts the enjoyment of it, the fa- even the fantasy aspect of it, right? You're doing what you see is happening in the movies. You're doing what Bruce Lee does. You're doing what the ninjas do. You're doing what, you know, the, 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 the you know, ha- palm of death does <laughs> in your head because you're 10, <laughs> you know, or 12. And then you gain recognition or, and achievement through it. I think that whole combination of that, you know, is, something that you can't recreate. I don't think you can recreate it. I think that, you know, yeah, there are fantastic accolades. There's some very emotional moments in, a, in anyone's martial arts journey, whether it be black belt or, 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 you know, master, I, I don't know how many, you know, accolades people have now, but I, I think the combination of the work, the ideal, the man and, and everything that involved in it, I think was so special that it, it clearly left an impression. Yeah, clearly. I mean, I can hear it in your voice as you're talking about it. You know, certainly it still, I mean, all these years later has an impact just, just to think about it. Mm-hmm. And of course, I'm sure he wasn't the only one that had a strong impact on your martial arts training, on your martial arts career. So I'd like you to think of somebody else, you know, ideally someone that you didn't train under directly. Tell us about somebody that helped you out, helped you moving forward, or just had a strong impact on you. You're, you're right. I have had quite a few people in my journey that have had a really strong impact on me. And um, other other masters and instructors that I've worked with over the years, um, uh, and, 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 you know, a hundred names come to your mind, you know, Paul and, and, and John Ailes and, and, 
the uh, Master McDonald from from Edinburgh, um, uh, Bob Karen, and and folks like that. But I thought about this when I saw this question, and one of the things that I wanted to get across in in the influences that I've had over my years of martial arts, and I think it's something that has really become um, an advantage to me, is that although I've had hugely influential people in my life on the journey, I have always taken something about it, taken something from their teaching, um, implemented it in my own life and my journey, and um, appreciated it, showed that appreciation as, as best I possibly could, and kept on the path in the journey. I've actually never um, you know, I stayed with, with uh, Mr. Spinella all the time that I could up until I was 16 um, or so. Um, he's the longest I stayed with one master. Um, the others I stayed with, you know, four or five years at a time. And then I, I in- inevitably moved on every single time. I haven't had one person through my journey. Um, and looking back, I think that I, that's actually worked to my, to my advantage because it's allowed me to be open to so many different influences as I've walked the path. And I've kept a lot of people as friends along the way, but I've, I, I've, I've gone through the journey, you know, of 30, what, seven plus years now, uh, taking a lot of what I could from people, um, and, and showing my appreciation for it and, and the interest in it. And, uh, but, but moving on as well to, to, to come up with and, and work with the school and, and the style that, that I have now. And I, I really think that that's been important for my, my path. Um, I don't think I would have done and, and been where I'm at right now if I would have stayed with Mr. Spinella. I don't think I would have stayed, uh, had the epiphanies and, and had the success that I have in different styles um, if I'd have stayed with one person or another one. Um, so the list is long, but I'm not really sure any one of them is more important than the other one. I think that the journey itself has been the most important thing. It's interesting. And certainly, you know, you're going to have a different perspective on your trading and you're going to be in a completely different spot because you've had such a diversified some would say scattered, but I, I don't really want to use that word because it sounds negative. You know, I, I guess diverse is probably a better one. Training and, and history through the arts. And, you know, I, I think that that's something that we often um, look down upon as traditionalists mm. that, you know, because there is something to be said for developing your skills in a particular art and taking them to a very, very high level. And of course, that takes a tremendous amount of time. You know, you can't be the best at Goju in 10 years or 20 years. You know, it, it requires finding Goju probably in your teens and training until you're 100 and then somehow not dying, right? Correct. Um, you know, Absolutely. but I think it, one of the things that I've I've always said about the martial arts, one of the things that I love about it is that it's as much or as little to you as you want it to be you can get out of it whatever you want and there's something to be said for that diversity and i think that there are a lot of martial artists that would do i don't want to say better could stand to train in some other things and round out their training a little bit and i think it all it depends on where you want want it to be um for me i i i kind of developed over decades the idea that I wanted to um, I, I wanted to develop more and more and more diversity and so from from pretty early on I think once my original school closed um, I kind of decided that my path was going to be a journey of many different arts until I found the one that really called to me and it's, it's, I don't know. It, it, it's interesting to me that what really did call to me in the end was creating, um, an art, 
um, from very established sources into something um, not new, but not um, completely linear from history. So, and and I think that that was the right thing for my path. I don't think I would be as as um, far along in my martial career. I certainly don't think I would have been as successful in my martial career if I didn't have those journeys in the Asian styles. And you know, some completed the black belt, some not. Um, but I think gaining the understanding and the years and years and years of teaching, um, because that has been a completely um, additional journey, just learning the art of teaching, learning the art of how to teach properly and going through all this growing pains and mistakes of, of being awkward in front of people and, and, and learning how to be a master in a house. It, it, that's, that's a journey in itself. And uh, I don't think I would have been ex- as successful or far along if I hadn't gone that way. Sure. Sure. I agree. Now, you've mentioned competition a couple times during our conversation. So, are, and, and I believe you mentioned it in the context of the, the Western martial arts. So, could you tell us what those competitions really look like for those that have never attended, like me? Sure. Sure. I, I, I did Asian style competitions um, of years, um, not with any um, seriousness, really, because um, they were fun and it was places I could go fight. And, you know, my friends went to them and I went to them. It was something that we all did. It was great. Um, I, I, I had been a, in my um, career, I've been a police officer and uh, they have what's called the police Olympics. And in the police Olympics, they actually have um, Asian martial arts tournaments as well. And I fought in those as well, which was a lot of fun. In the Western style, um, the tournaments are, are developing in an interesting way. Um, some tournaments are, um, very much like an Asian style tournament where you will have the four corner judges and a center ju- and a center official, and they'll have the red and the white flag, you know, and, uh, you'll have various weapon styles up or grappling or dagger. And, um, the, they will call usually Leon or Elise in French and, uh, they will fight. And when someone is struck, they will stop it. They will look at the judges, the judges will score it, and then they will move on. And there are timed rounds. Um, and they will do that in synthetic weapons and, and in rebated, the steel weapons. And they will do that in anything from very soft armor, much like modern fencing gear, all the way through to full steel. There's also full contact combat tournaments, um, organizations like the Battle of Nations, Um, And they have melees um, where it's literally um, the old medieval style lists, except for um, your team defeats another team by putting the other team on the ground. So you can fight and hit and, and grapple and do all the things that you need to do, but you need to get the other person on the ground. And once they're on the ground, they are neutralized, considered dead. And it's basically battles of attrition. And those are huge events. Um, and they, they happen in many countries, as do the HEMA events. And then you have a lot of the reenactment uh, groups that use the wooden weapons, and they will do tournaments by an honor system, to which the combatants will actually be on the field, and they will fight, but the, the strike is actually determined by the person who is hit. So if, Jeremy, if you and I were fighting each other, whether it be... Uh, with swords or sword and shield or spears or what have you, and you struck me with a blow, um, and through time and training, you get to calibrate the strength of that blow. If you hit me, it is up to me and my honor um, to acknowledge that blow and to call it good. And um, that's a very interesting style of tournament, one which I love. I don't love all everything about it. And the tournaments that I sponsor, the tournaments that I hold, um, are a little bit of a hybrid of that. Our tournaments are um, time tournaments, they are full contact tournaments, and they are they, the only judge is the floor judge. Um, we have markers on each side, and what will happen is they'll have uh, flags, 
but you're only flagging for your corner. So you have a red and a white corner. You have a red flag on one side, white flag on the other side. The two combatants will come out and they will fight continuously. And what happens is you strike, the other person is, is, it's on their honor to call the blow and they'll say hit. And then the marker will show the tally where that, that blow was struck. And the center judge can also override something. If somebody's clearly hit, but they're, they've got a lot of adrenaline, or they're more inexperienced, the more inexperienced fighters, the more the, the center judge will go ahead and determine, yay, that was a good blow, point to this side. And uh, that's how it goes. Um, we also have what's called um, the after strike. And this is something that you don't see, I, I don't believe, in Asian style tournaments. And that means that if you and I, Jeremy, are sparring for fighting, and I strike you, we'll say we're using long swords, and I strike you with this long sword, right? About a beat or a second, um, within about a second after that, if you strike me back, right, my point is nullified. And the reason for that, it's called zupio, a double kill. And the reason for that is we don't want people committing suicide to win a fight because we want to keep the technique pure, as pure as we can. We want to keep the technique, right? The foundation to every martial art, Asian, Western, Indian, uh, I don't care where you find it, the prime directive of every martial art is to strike and not be struck. And I hold to that. So the tournaments that, that we sponsor um, all adhere to that. And a lot of the HEMA tournaments adhere to that. And they have what's called the afterblow. And that just simply means that you can't just run in and, and hope to throw a shot and the fight's going to be over. The fight is not over. And if you're struck within that beat and you both strike, then they stop, stop it for a second. They call a dupio or a double kill and then they reset the fighters. Interesting. And that's kind of the similarity or, or parallel in a lot of Asian martial art competitions where you might have point sparring versus uh, what a lot of competitions call continuous sparring, right? you know, where the, where it's not stopped, you know, cause you can blitz over someone's guard as a lot of people would call it. And then, you know, still take a, a nice solid roundhouse kick to the face. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> cool. Well, those sound, sound really fun. I'm going to have to keep an eye out, see if there's something nearby that I can go check out. And- and a large, a lot of the large tournaments do streaming video. Um, they're doing a lot of streaming content now. So if you look up oh. tournaments like Long Point or SoCal Sword Fight on YouTube, they'll actually have three hours of the tournaments and all its vari- variations that you can watch. So it's not hard to find. Oh, neat. I'll see if I can find some of that stuff and put it in the show notes. And for anybody that's new, I haven't mentioned it yet, but... All of our show notes and episodes and everything are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. So we've covered a lot of stuff, a lot of good stuff, and, and you've told some amazing stories today. But let's learn a little bit more about who you are. You made some reference to some movies and how they influenced you to beat rocks and sand. <laughs> uh, you know, just reminding me of some of the things that I did myself as a kid, you know, yep. having watched movies and my own makiwara in the backyard and, yep, and things yep, like yep. that. But if I had to pin you down to one or two favorite martial arts movies, what would those be? Uh, I, sure. I actually, um, I love, I love martial arts movies and, uh, I have a lot of favorites, of course, and I have them for different reasons, you know, and this nostalgic reasons, you know, um, the Five Deadly Venoms and, and, and things like that from the Kung Fu Theater days. I love those movies. And uh, uh, many movies coming up, growing up, that you just grew up. I'm an 80s kid, so, you know, all the horribly bad 80s ninja movies and, and those movies are fantastic. But um, because I am the, you know, token medieval guy right now, a Western stylist guy, I'm going to give you some Western movies that I really, really love and enjoy. Um, one of them is called okay, The Duelist. The Duelist was uh, one of Ridley Scott's first really big production movies, and it happens in the Napoleonic era. Um, uh, Harvey Keitel, oddly enough, and uh, Keith Carradine star in it. And it is a, in a, a movie that happens in the Napoleonic era, and it's basically a quarrel between these two officers in the Napoleonic army. And they literally fight, I think, five or six duels through this with sabers, small swords on horseback 
with pistols. Um, and there's some brilliant sword play in these movies, some brilliant sword play. Um, and I mean, they go at each other in a lot of scenes and it's got some fantastic sword work. Um, and a lot of people I think do realize because of the Western styles aren't as popular, how much of a martial arts sword play is. And Hollywood really hasn't caught up yet as far as using real Western techniques in sword play, especially older medieval Western techniques. But having said that, um, some of the later period stuff, what we consider later period, 17th century, 18th century, um, stuff, um, had come out really, really good in, in a few movies. And one of them is, is the duelist. That's a really, I, one I really enjoy. Um, another one that I like as far as, uh, some of the nightly virtues is a movie called kingdom of heaven. Orlando Bloom stars in it. Um, and there are some pretty inspiring scenes in that, you know, very much pump you up scenes. I know in a couple of episodes of your podcast, you've had people mentioned um, gladiator, uh, and, and how that pumps people up in, in, you know, for the day or for whatever they're doing. Uh, Kingdom of Heaven does that for me as well. Um, you know, parts where it says, you know, does, does making someone a knight make them a better fighter? Well, yes. <laughs> and uh, especially when your life's on the line, it, did, it, it does in that instance. And so uh, uh, I think that's pretty inspiring. Another one that uh, is a little bit later period, but um, has some fine, fine, sword play in it is Captain Alatriste, uh, which is a Vigo Mortison movie. Um, and unfortunately, I think it's subtitled in Spanish. Vigo is bi bilingual, and he actually did the entire movie in Spanish. And uh, But the rapier, sword and dagger, sword and cloak uh, uh, play in that movie is some of the best ever caught on film. And it's definitely worth, worth a watch. Oh, cool. We'll make sure to link those over at the website so people can check them out. Interesting yeah, side about, note. Interesting please. side note about Gladiator. There's actually we have writings from the third century by an author named Vegetus who talks about how the Roman centurion um, at that time, especially by the third century, uh, the Roman legions were being taught a lot of times, especially towards the home country, by gladiators because they were so good at combat. Um, but Vegetus actually talks about um, uh, each centurion having to limb a tree and dig it deep enough into the ground and place it into the ground as a post where it's still stuck out of the ground by six feet, but would not sway with contact. And then they were required two hours a day to practice with a double weighted sword and a wicker shield every single day. And it's one of the first um, written instances we have about how sword play was practiced in the ancient world. So that's kind of an interesting side note. Oh, that's really neat. I wouldn't want to dig that hole. That's for sure. <laughs> I mean, there, there's your first test. That's it's a, that's it. It's a lot rougher than uh, waxing Miyagi's car. Right. Right. <laughs> How about actors? Is there anybody that stands out for you? Yeah. Um, again, I I I, I love uh, uh, Donnie Yen's uh, spear work. I, I don't think I have never seen a movie that shows control of a spear as well as, as what I've seen on some of the things that the hero duel between him and Jet Li, I watch over and over and over again. And I find something new and different and unique that he does in that duel. Um, every time his mastery of that weapon is, is awe inspiring. Um, yeah. Another great actor is probably one you, you're not familiar with. He may be, I don't know. His name is Anthony DeLongis and Anthony DeLongis. You may not, be familiar with him, but you've actually seen him a lot. He's been in a couple of the Highlander TV shows. Um, he's a, more of a fight choreographer, but he does acting gigs every now and again. And he he had he worked on Highlander as a fight choreographer and swordmaster. He uh, has a mastery of the bullwhip as well. So he taught you know when Catwoman does her bullwhip, um, that's Anthony DeLonge's teaching. Um, he was on set teaching that, um, in, uh, what is it? Fearless, uh, in the first duels, the gentleman that fights him with a saber, that's Anthony DeLonges. Okay, cool. Yeah. There, there's actually, there are quite a few. I've, I've heard the name. I wouldn't have been able to place him, but you know, that, that name did ring a little bit of a bell. Yeah. And although I don't know the gentleman, I've met him, uh, two or three times and he's always been, you know, fantastic and cordial 
um, wonderful guy. Uh, but uh, he's 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 actually really great at what he does, uh, actor actor wise. Uh, but I I I jump back and forth all the time. I'm a fan of martial arts movies as a whole, not just one genre of it. So you know you got Donnie Yen on one side, you know showing how the spear is supposed to be done, man. And then you have people like Anthony and, and other fighters that uh, that really take on the Western weapons with with great flair. Jose Ferrer in Cyrano de Bergerac um, was one of my original, you know, watch all the time movies. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, great stuff, absolutely great stuff. How about books? Do you have any any paper you'd recommend to us, or digital paper? I guess absolutely. Um, I'm a voracious reader. I have a huge library of, of books on dueling and, and the medieval area, the Renaissance area, era, um, all the way down. Uh, one uh, that I read uh, pretty religiously every year is called By the Sword by Richard Cohen. And it's a book that takes um, kind of the history of the sword as written down by authors um, from the early um, ancient age all the way through modern to modern fencing. And uh, it's a great read. Um, very captivating, especially if you're interested in the sword at all. And he goes through not only the Western style weapons, but a lot of the Asian style weapons. He talks about a lot of the Asian swords masters, Japanese sword masters, especially even some of the uh, swordsmiths. Um, you know, he tells the the tale about the cursed sword uh, by the, the mad um, sword master and how uh, his swords, because he was considered mad, um, his swords um, were especially dangerous and how, you know, there was even uh, decrees uh, by the warring families that if one of his swords were found, it was to be destroyed because people feared them so much. Um, his book's really engaging. Um, another one for younger readers, I, I think it's still cool. I read it still. Uh, but for younger readers, it's a book called Castle Diary. The Journey of uh, Tobias Burgess, and it's authored by a guy named Richard Platt, and it's illustrated. It's really heavily illustrated by a guy named uh, Chris Riddell. And if you've got kids, uh, young adults, or, or even adults um, that appreciate a good illustrated book, it's not a big read. It's not a heavy read at all. It's it's you know it's geared towards kids, but it's a fantastic book, and it's about a, a young boy in the 11th or 12th century who goes to his uncle's and he learns what it is to be a knight and um, has a lot of, you know, things that they had to do as far as archery. Archery was a, a big part in, in a young um, medieval child's um, grazing, especially the hunt and such. And a lot of things that he had to do um, on his way to knighthood. So that one's a great one. And a third one I'll give you is a fictional book which uh, I think is really interesting. And it's not really anything to do with Western styles. It's called The Musashi Flex by Steve Perry. And he wrote, it's the last book in his Matador series. And um, Steve Perry is a, a Screema Kali practitioner. And it's a fantastic series of books, but you can read The Musashi Flex on its own. And it's very much a journey of the uh, protagonist um, uh, way in, in understanding the martial arts and understanding what it means to society, what it means to him, what it means to what he wants to leave as a legacy and a journey. And, uh, I, 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 I love that book. I think it's fantastic. So that's a really great one. Cool. And we've had a couple of people mention the Matador series on the show before. So it's nice to get another recommendation for that. You know, the more that those books pop up, the more, likely I am to read them, of course, and I'm sure the more likely others are. So we'll all have to start checking those out, I guess. Now, you mentioned that you train every day or nearly every day. I think you said I every do. day. I do. So what is it that keeps you motivated? Are there goals? Are there things you're you're looking to accomplish? Or or is it passion? You know, What's keeping you fired up? There's a lot of things that are, that are keeping me motivated. Um, the school itself... Um, my, my school itself, being an instructor, um, I think that if you are not continually learning, um, you're going to be, you're going to end up getting stale and I still love to fight. 
you know, um, I have had combat in my lineage or in my journey my entire life. And I'm fascinated with the art of fighting, not just being a martial artist, but the actual practical application in the art of fighting. And so in as many venues and as many weapon styles as I can, I like to study and apply those applications. And Avlamaki itself, like the, like the traditional manuscripts, is a battlefield art. So what that means is simply that it's, it's meant for practical use, but it's meant for, um, I try to take as, as, as much flair out of the movements as possible and, and make them very direct. Um, but for me personally, I want to show my students or anyone that, that uh, follows what I do um, the sincerity in, in why I do it. And the sincerity in why I do it for me is to really push myself to be as successful as I can possibly be. I think sometimes um, folks get in a, in a stagnant kind of rut when they only follow, or, or I, I shouldn't say that. I, it's, it's a tough thing for me to explain. It's been easier for me to say it for me personally. For me personally, I don't want to just practice an art. I want to excel in it. And I don't just want to practice the application. I want to excel. And I want to um, be as successful in it as possible. And so that's why, whether it be a reenactment group, whether it be a HEMA group, whether it be, uh, you know, a, a combat league group, I have, you know, I've won the highest tournaments in all of these venues. The reason being is because, especially in my, in, you know, where the ones I can get to, you know, there's some back east that I haven't got to yet. And I'm, you know, on fire to go fight in those. But I want to be not only a practitioner, but a successful one in it. So I feel that that gains me the, um, the knowledge and the, the, the view um, when I bring it back to my students. Um, they can look at it as, as, as that I'm still passionate about what I do. And I am. And I'm, I'm passionate about my ideas and my beliefs in, in what a martial arts should be. You know, I, I, I'll give you a for instance. I don't like the uh, the practice of coaching in tournaments. So you get two competitors out there and they are fighting and you have these coaches on each side. And it's not just in martial arts. They do it in UFC and they do it in other things. Um, they do it in, you know, all of the things where they're screaming, their coaches, a corner, screaming out what to do. Right. And I understand that it's a, it's a tradition that people in our tradition, but it's a thing that people do, right? They have this, this huge corner, or a couple of people in their corner and they're screaming what to do. Well, to me, that is the coaches playing chess with human pieces. I would love to see a fight isolated where the combatants could not hear their coaches and see what it turned out to be because they're looking at it from a completely different point of view. To me, uh, as a duelist, and that's really what a fight between two people are as a duel. I feel that there's importance in having just you to rely on there. All the training and coaching that you get from someone is great. But I think that when it comes down to it and you're testing these skills in a practical application, is it not the better test to have just you, just your mind, just your wit, you know, just your cunning? And that's been a goal of mine, you know, to, to purport in our tournaments, we don't allow coaching, you know, we don't allow it at all. Um, and even in historical applications, some judicial duels in the medieval period, if you had, if you had judicial duelists fighting out there and somebody was offering advice, um, they were taken away and punished. It was bad. Uh, we don't go to those extremes, but we try to, uh, <laughs> we try to, we try, you know, educate as far as like our tournaments, we have to, sometimes you have to tell the soccer bombs or the soccer dads out there. It's not actually okay to be screaming at the kids um, while they're fighting. Um, you can't, you don't get to do that. And it's interesting, but, but it works. It works very well. And that's my motivation to, to kind of purport not only the art of it, but the ideal of chivalry with it. And um, that's something I think that I've been on fire for for years and I've really not, lost the heat for it. I've been really um, excited about continuing it. Nice. And as you're talking about the prohibition on 
coaching and people in the stands, I think would would make for some interesting competitions if parents were dragged out of the bleachers for yeah coaching their children and, and dragged into another ring and now now they have oh, yeah. to oh, now they yeah. have to fight. I mean that I've seen and you know you be a lot of fun. I don't know if you, you've probably been to you've been to those softball games or those basketball games or some other sports oh, yeah. event where the, these parents are horrible to each other. They're screaming and and you know I cannot I can't have a school and a system and a style and a and an ideology of the virtues of chivalry and have people and, 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 you know, allow people to act that way. I, you know, one of the things that, that allows me to do what I do is I don't, um, I, I won't go with the flow on it. I will say, I just simply say no, you know, and I've had conversations with people asking me about, you know, the, the whole coaching thing and my tournaments, I don't allow it. And people are like, well, you know, it's done all the time. Absolutely. Just because it done, it's done doesn't make it right. And if I have my say, and I do, um, you don't get to. You get to be out there by yourself. You get to do this alone. And I think that it has made, especially, you know, I, you know, I'm biased. I, lo- I love my students. And I think that my students have, uh, have been better for it, more confident for it. Um, I think that they have to discuss things on the floor. If they don't feel something is right, they have to talk about it on the floor. The rule is once you leave the mat, it's done. It's done. So talk about it on the mat. I like that. So now's your chance to promote yourself, your commercial. If someone's near you or is coming out to visit the West Coast and maybe wants to train or participate in one of your competitions, how do they find out more? You can go to Knight's Quest, one word, dot U.S., that's the website. And knightsquest.us has the links to our Facebook page and our um, Instagram, all our links. It even has our links to our YouTube channel. With uh, We do a free YouTube channel, obviously. Uh, but we do a channel on there called The Modern Medieval, or Knight's Quest Modern Medieval. And it's a lot to do with introduction of some of the old manuscripts, what they're about. Um, questions that um, people have, you know, uh, asked and wrote in about. So, you know, I had a lot of people writing in about kicks and punches. So we did an episode on it. Um, and I also do DIY projects, do-it-yourself projects for people that might want to practice at home or get a, a, a little bit of introduction to it on how to make practice weapons. Um, and I try to, and I keep the cost under $20. So the say the practice post, we call it a Pell um, that we're talking about. Um, I show you how to make a modern one uh, from stuff from Home Depot for under 20 bucks or a practice sword, which is called a cudgel, um, a wooden sword, sometimes called a waster. Um, we show you how to make a safe one for under 20 bucks or a practice spear or a shield. So you can go um, to our website, the knightsquest.us website. And you can get right on there that shows the links to the YouTube page and to all the pages on there. You can also email me and contact me directly. Um, I always travel. Uh, we have a DVD out on the basic sword and shield technique of our style of La Machia. Um, that's for sale on the website, but you can call, ask any question you want to. Um, I'm, I'm really, really open to, to anybody asking anything they want. I think that's one of the greatest things about the technology that we have now. It's also a curse. You know, people like to, uh, say bad things on the internet. They get those internet muscles and they think they're, <laughs> um, and that's fine. Um, uh, but I, I, I think it's a necessary evil to be able to have conversations um, and, you know, help people out as far as any information that they need about the medieval masters or about where I get my sources or any of that. It's all on that, on that website, the knightsquest.us. And I do seminars. I, like I said, I travel all across the country. Um, usually people just, you know, uh, pay to ship me someplace and I'll take care of my, 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 uh, accommodations once I get there. Um, and I'll do anything from two day to sometimes four or five day um, blocks of education. We do everything on 
introduction to sword and shield to medieval wrestling to dagger work to practical application. In other words, this medieval technique happens in Solhofer in the 1420s. This is, if you're walking down the street, is how you would interpret this technique to help you not die. <laughs> so, mm, yeah. um, you, uh, we, uh, we do a lot of that. So, yeah, that's the best place. That's the best source. Cool. And, you know, we'll link to all that stuff over on the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Really appreciate you being here. But why don't you take us out on a high note? Any parting advice for everyone listening? Absolutely. Um, our motto for the school in Latin is vis viris creo via. And what that basically means is might makes way. Not might makes right. Might makes way. Um, what we teach and what we mean by that is do not let life happen to you. Do not let circumstance and life just happen to you. Um, there is virtue in being um, partially of the stoic tradition, understanding um, a situation, uh, determining what are the outcomes, both good and bad, accepting them and moving forward. But it's also imperative for anyone, martial artists, non-martial artists, just everyday human, to take a chance to not let life happen to you. Get out there. If you have a passion, martial arts related or not, invest yourself in it. Um, one of the greatest quotes I've ever heard is, um, everything has a life price. It's always the equal amount of life you're willing to invest in it to achieve. And there's, you know, obviously some plain truth to that, but be willing to achieve it. Be willing to invest your life to do it and don't let circumstances be the end all be all, you know, make yourself mighty, whether it be education, whether it be in physical fitness, whether it be in knowledge, um, cause sometimes there's a difference between education and knowledge. Um, but don't let life happen to you. Um, make your own self mighty and make your own way. Thank you for listening to episode 78 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Sir Gemini. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes with everything we talked about, including a video from the Long Point competition that we discussed on today's show. If you like the show, make sure you're subscribing or using one of our free apps. They're available on both iOS and Android. For those of you kind enough to leave us a review, remember we randomly check out the different podcast review sites, and if we find your review and mention it on the air... Be sure to email us for your free box of Whistlekick stuff. If you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Or if you want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show or some other feedback, there's a place to do that too. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, pretty much everywhere you can think of. And our username is always Whistlekick. Every episode is also available on YouTube, so check us out there if you have a chance. And remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com, like our awesome sparring boots, available in a bunch of sizes, and recently, two colors, black and red now. If you're a school owner or a team coach, you can even buy our sparring gear wholesale. If you want to check that out, that's wholesale.whistlekick.com. But that's it for today, so until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.